Today is a special day. It's our two-year anniversary. I'm also, uh, this will be our, our first time doing this. I'm doing a t- team preaching sermon. I will be delivering the first half, and then Lucero will be delivering the second half, So, which is very fun and exciting. So, um, Tammy, I knew better. I wasn't going to have her go first, and then I have to follow her. So, we, you know, we did that to you. But, um, all right, so what we're going to be Uh, I want you to think about this question. We're looking at our our sort of anniversary Sunday, and God has done a lot of amazing things over the last two years. And the amazing things he's done has been using people. Like God uses us to accomplish his purposes. It's pretty amazing. And to me, it's what I want to live for. I I want to live for God using me to accomplish his purposes, eternal purposes, life-changing purposes. So have you ever felt like you did not have the right qualifications for God to use you. And as you think about that question, what kind of qualifications might we think that God is looking for? Maybe you have to come from the right family for God to use you. Or maybe you have to have the right education for God to use you, or the right skill set for God to use you. Well, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at that. So how could God use me? Maybe on the other side of the coin, there's some certain sins from your background and you go, I've done these things. I, I have done these things. God could never use me. Uh, perhaps there's addictions that you've dealt with or are still dealing with. And you go, God would never use me. He, would, he couldn't use me. I've disqualified myself. Or there's certain things from your past and you go, well, certainly God couldn't or wouldn't use me because of my past. Well, I've, I've showed this picture before, uh, so just, but, but uh, this is a picture of, it's kind of a grainy picture. I pulled this off of my friends from high school's Facebook page. This is our senior class of Troy High School football from Troy, Ohio. We won conference, and this is our senior class, and we're all, we're all very excited about winning conference. Now, I'm in this photo, and I blew up the section uh, where I'm in. So may, maybe you can spot me, number five, William Black. He's kind of in front of me, covering me up. What I want you to, what I want you to notice on this photo, I'm going to walk over here and hope I don't get feedback uh, from the mics. What I want you to notice on this photo blown up is, do you notice two different shades of red here in these jerseys? Do you wonder, maybe their high school had mismatched jerseys. Like may, maybe they had two different colors because they couldn't afford to buy the same color for everyone. I don't know. You look at the photo, it's kind of evident. Some are wearing definitely dark, you know, darker red colors, and some are wearing quite bright, like me, the brighter version. Well, the, the difference of those jerseys is the dark red jerseys are filled with sweat uh, because those are the players who played. Okay, those are the players who got on the field. And uh, the ones that are nice, bright, cherry red, like they just came off the shelf, those are, of us, uh, those, are those of us that sat on the bench the whole game. You may also notice uh, the, the sock style that different players choose to wear. Some players, like myself, choose to raise their socks way up high, and the socks, we choose to wear nice, bright, white socks, uh, like many of you are wearing today. Other players, uh, like William here, choose to have their socks down at their ankles, and their socks are the color of dirt. Well, that is also uh, because those are the players who got on the field, and when you play in football, your socks tend to drag down on the ground and get covered with sweat and dirt and all kinds of other things. Now, uh, I didn't play in high school. I sat the bench. It's because I didn't have the right qualifications to get into the game. I did not have the right amount of strength as a qualification to get onto the field. I didn't have the right size as a qualification to get on the field. I did not have the right agility or athletic ability to get onto the field. I didn't have the right coordination or, frankly, confidence to play in a way to get onto the field. And I'm going to tell you, it hurt. It was really fun to be on the team, but it hurt to feel like, I was on the team, but I really wasn't. I was sort of a second-class player, a second-class citizen. This is a true story. My senior year in statistics class, you know, math class senior year, our teacher had a a T-shirt on. It was a rivalry week. So we have a big rival, the troy Piqua rivalry. It's a big deal. There's T-shirts every year. So she's wearing her T-shirt. And she's having every player in her class 
sign the t-shirt. And at my high school, uh, this was like a high discipline sort of, sort of team uh, program. We always wore ties to school on the day of a game. So games are on Friday. That is a school day. We always, always, always wore ties, neckties and dress shirts, okay? So she goes around and has all the players in her class. Uh, she, she goes to them, hey, sign the shirt, sign the shirt, sign the shirt. Maybe there's five or six, seven players in the class, three or four, I don't remember. She doesn't ask me to sign her shirt. She doesn't realize I'm on the team, okay? And I'm sitting there like, this is awkward. And one of our teammates said, don't forget Noah. He's on the team too. And she's, oh, I feel so bad. I didn't know. Guys, it's, I'm wearing a tie to high school, okay? In my statistics, statistics class, I'm wearing a tie and my teacher does not know why I'm wearing a tie. She, did, did she think, oh, this nice young man just decided to wear a tie today. There's absolutely no way he could be on the football team. He must just be wearing a tie. It hurt, right? It, it, it was a different experience than my friends on the team. And I would say my sports career in high school, it hurt even more to try out three different times for the high school baseball team and get cut every time. See, with football, they let anybody on the team, as long as you go to practice and go to the weight room and do the work, they let you play and there's a junior varsity and all this sort of thing. But baseball, they don't do that. They have a limited amount of players who can play and they just cut you if you don't make the team. You're done. There's nothing. You're just, you didn't make the team and you're done. Well, that happened to me three different times. Try it out, try it out, try it out. And I never made the team. And baseball was really cool at my school. I mean, they got their last name stitched on the back of their jerseys. They got these cool baseball hats with the T on them. They'd wear them all the time. And I mean, it was cool. I just, and, and why didn't I make the team? I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough to make the team. And I missed out on a lot. I would have enjoyed playing. I enjoyed playing baseball. I missed playing the game of baseball. But I also missed socially in high school. I miss being cooler. You would be much cooler if you made the baseball team. I would have been more accepted. I would have been seen as more attractive, and I, I would have just felt more valuable. I would have been treated as more valuable because I'd had the qualifications that allowed me to make the team, and I didn't get to experience that. All right, so we're going to break back into groups. For those of you that are new, we do this every Sunday at Mosaic. Hopefully, my side of the room, we can do a, we, we're, we got this this time. We got this. We got our groups. We're ready. We're ready to go. We are, right, we're ready. We're ready. We can do this. We've got five minutes, and we're going to have these two questions. They're meant to be very non-confrontational. They're not, they're not about God or the Bible or anything. You don't have to know anything about that to, to participate. If you feel comfortable participating, here's two questions. One was a time, like I, like I shared, you were unqualified for something like a sports team or a theater production or a music group. And how did that feel? So I hope you can look back and laugh at some of those experiences, maybe from your, your, your high school years. But I know some of this could be pain. It can still be painful. So as much as you feel comfortable uh, to share. And then how does our culture give value to people based on their qualifications? And, and that's a little deeper of a question. Uh, but I, I think that setup in our culture, it, it can really send a lot of negative messages to a lot of us. So take five minutes, uh, see what you can cover, and just get to know the people you're sitting with, and then we'll come back up to finish up uh, the message. And this is real. Like, this is a part of our culture that we don't often even think about all this rejection and cutting, you know, that comes from uh, cutting from teams and cutting from, from you know, mus musicals and things like that, um, let alone into adult life when we start applying this qualification metric system to, to everybody. So we're going to talk to you today uh, a little bit about a guy named Moses. And um, I want to give you just a, a really brief overview of his life. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Lucero. And uh, Moses, you may have heard the name before. You may not have. He's from the Old Testament way, way, way before Jesus. And God used Moses to free the Hebrew slaves from Egypt and to bring them up out of Egypt. Uh, and it's a, kind of the whole story of the Old Testament started uh, in, in this, this part of it, started with Moses. So as a baby, we're looking at Moses as a person today. And as a baby, here's a few things that happened to him. You can read about them in Exodus 2. 
his mom left him in a basket in the reeds of the Nile River. Now, why would she do that? Because Pharaoh was trying to kill all of the, the, the sons that were born to the Hebrew slaves. Pharaoh was afraid. There's like all these kids. They're going to take over. They're going to have this big army. They're going to take over my, my kingdom. So we're going to kill all the boys. So, but baby Moses didn't know that reason. He just knew he got left in a basket in the reeds of the Nile River. Uh, Pharaoh's daughter is at the river. She's bathing. She sees the baby in the reeds. Uh, just fast forwarding a long story short, she takes the baby to, to save his life. Uh, and, and, but then they need a mom to nurse the baby. And so they go and find a Hebrew mom that is able to nurse and they find Moses' mom. She's able to nurse her actual baby for a little while. It doesn't say for how long as he gets a bit old enough, she has to give him back to Pharaoh's daughter who takes him as her son. So think about if you know anything about emotional health, about mental health, uh, all of the things that little baby and infant and child Moses is experiencing at this time. He, he's dealing with attachment. He's dealing with his identity. He's dealing with his sense of value. He's dealing with these questions of who am I? So Moses is a Hebrew and he's being raised as Egyptian royalty in the palace of the Egyptian pharaoh, literally looking out the window at his Hebrew people enslaved. That is a very strange identity crisis to grow up with. And I don't think we often put that together when we read the story of Moses. So he, it creates incredible problems for him later in life. Uh, Exodus 2, 11 to 12, it says, One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian, and he hid him in the sand. I got to say, I can relate to Moses in this situation. Moses sees an injustice. He sees his own people are enslaved, and now one of his own relatives, it's being beaten by an Egyptian slave master. And so this righteous anger builds up in Moses, and he says, I'm going to go fix this. I'm going to go take care of this. And he goes and kills the Egyptian to make things right. I think it was right for him to want to end injustice. But what he did is he did it his way. Moses did it Moses' way instead of doing it God's way, which we see later in the book of Exodus. If you read the rest of the story, you see how God actually freed his people from injustice later in the story. But Moses was impulsive, he was in a hurry, and he was rushed. Do you relate to that at all in your relationship with God? Impulsive, in a hurry, and rushed. And so he did it in his own power instead of seeking God and waiting on God. Now, the next verse, we find out this gets him in a lot of trouble. The next day he went out and he saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And you see very quickly here that Moses did not belong anywhere. Moses didn't belong anywhere because he did not have the qualifications of either group. He was unqualified to be an Egyptian, let's face it. He was still Hebrew scum to those Egyptians. He's all dressed up like one of them, but they knew who he was, they knew what he was, and there's no way he was accepted in that palace. But he was also unqualified now to be a Hebrew. Why? Because he was the Egyptian elite. He was living in the palace. He dressed like an Egyptian. He acted like an Egyptian. And they're thinking, you abandoned us. You're a traitor. How dare you come to us as if you have authority to try to be an arbiter between our argument. And you see in Moses a very confused identity. He doesn't know who he is a lack of acceptance. He's being rejected by Hebrews. He's rejected by Egyptians. And I think Moses at this point is feeling very useless. In fact, I think he killed the Egyptian to try to gain some street cred with the Hebrews and it blew up 
in his face. They have zero respect for him. So Pharaoh hears of the murder of one of his own Egyptian guards by Moses, and he tries to kill Moses. So Moses flees, and he goes to Midian, which is another word for middle of nowhere. He is a shepherd for 40 years in Midian. Imagine 40 years feeling useless, like you squandered this opportunity that God gave you. God put you in the palace, and you squandered it, and now you're tending sheep for 40 years. 40 years of feeling like a failure for committing a murder, 40 years of feeling like a failed rescuer, rejected by your own people, and we see how this hung over Moses' head the whole time. Uh, If you look at verse 22 of Exodus 2, we learn about Moses' son. His wife Zipporah gave birth to a son. Moses named him Gershom, saying, I've become a foreigner in a foreign land. And the word Gershom in Hebrew literally is meaning an alien there. He named his child an alien there. He is an alien in a foreign land, so much that the shame of that he passed on to his son. Can you imagine saying to your son, how was school today, an alien there? How was your breakfast, an alien there? Like literally this name is the word, an alien there. This is how disconnected Moses is with the sense of identity. I think his identity was as a reject. I think his identity was as being unqualified and that followed him every single day. And I wonder how many messages like that, messages of rejection, are hanging over our heads in this room that we have internalized as our identity. I'll never measure up. I've squandered. I've wasted. I'm a screw up. I think Moses was dealing with all of those things. This is my last slide, and I'm going to bring Lucero up to take the baton from here. If you're in the wilderness or you feel like a failure or that you've wasted your life, or that you haven't measured up, you're in very good company with the people that God loves to use. God is not a football coach. Can we say amen to that? God is not a football coach. And God loves to use people that feel like failures or that feel unqualified. One of my favorite verses, this actually ties into last week's sermon, but we ran out of time. Um, The religious leaders saw Peter and John. This is New Testament. This is with Jesus. And they're doing all these preaching and these miracles. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. He's gone back to heaven. They're on their own now. And this is what they say. They saw the courage of Peter and John, and they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Great transition. Thank you, Noah. <clears throat> hey, before I start, I have a challenge for all of you in here right now. Are you guys up for the challenge? Depends. Um, it requires movements, but it requires no physical agility. So if you're not considered so super agile, it's okay. Um, if you get anxious, I want to validate that and say, it's going to be okay. Just trust me on this. I don't like this distance. Let me be honest with you. I don't want to feel like I'm talking down on people. I want to feel like we're having a conversation and we're talking and learning about one of God's people. So in 30 seconds, if you're able to move up, and I don't care about rows. I don't need rows. I need everyone to scooch up. You can bring your own seat. Or you can just take the seat in front of you, and then everyone goes like in succession like that. If you have a baby, you can stay where you are. Like I know it's like more movement. So if you have a baby, you can stay where you are. But can everybody please scooch up? I want everybody here. It's like family talk. Like we're in the living room talking about Jesus. I don't bite. I might, I might, I might spit. That might be a little too close for me. I'm just saying. Right, right here is good, right? So if I can come up over here, I can come over here. This is great. Um, are you guys feeling safe? Are you guys feeling good? Are you guys feeling good? I work with teenagers every single day. Sometimes I'm worried about myself, but it works out in the end. So um, I think, Noah, that was a great transition into the points that I have that I want to share with you today. Um, Mo- the story of Moses is one that... I've loved ever since I was a child. Um, Even this weekend, we were watching the new Netflix show 
the Testament of Moses. Have I seen anyone seen it up there? And because I know the story so well, there's some inaccuracies, let me tell you that. There are some inaccuracies in it, but I really appreciated the imagery and to see this story come alive. And so before I start, I want to give you some context into who I am. So if this is the first time you've ever seen me, if this is the first time you've ever heard me, um, if you've only known me for a little bit of time, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in northern Mexico, right on the border, so I was really sad I couldn't make it to the exhibit because I really wanted to see how this was portrayed. So I've grown up seeing people on those little boats trying to make it across the border, trying to get into this, what a lot of immigrants call this promised land, right? This American dream. I grew up in that. I grew up in a house that was at the edge of a field with um, pickup trucks dropping off people, people jumping off the back of pickup trucks, jumping over a fence, running across the field, going to the river to cross, right? All of that thing. So context, grew up in Mexico. My first language is Spanish. So. Sometimes I still have a bit of an accent. I hear it's more of a rhythm. The way that I talk has a rhythm to it, not necessarily the sound of the words, but how I put them together. Um, I moved to the US when I was 14. So I was 14 years old in middle school. Uh, my parents are in ministry. I had the opportunity to come to school in Michigan. So I came to Michigan at the age of 14. And I lived with three different families in a span of seven years. All right, seven years, no, five years. Five years, three different families, all great. I wasn't like kicked out or anything. I'm not rebellious like that. It was just more like, hey, this is what we signed up for. And I was like, I understand, all great families, right? Five years of that. Then I go to high school, go to college, and I'm here still. So I came in the year 2010, it is 2024. If you know how to do math, how many years is that? 14, thank you for following with me. I'm also a teacher. I like it when people talk back to me. Not in the disrespectful way. Um, more like in the, hey, let's have a conversation and learn together, hence this. So hopefully you start to feel a little bit more comfortable um, with having me up here. A couple of months ago um, in December, I actually taught my school on the story of Moses. Um, teenagers are very insecure. Adults are also very insecure, but we know how to cover it better, okay? So there's that aspect of it. And so when I'm teaching this story, this setup of Moses, right? He was a, a foreigner in a foreign land. I'm here, but I don't feel like I fit here. There are all of these things in my past that are trying to tell me that I should be somewhere else, that I should be doing something else. And so you have this identity crisis, and it feels uncomfortable, and you don't know where to go with it. And... Something that is refreshing about God, and kind of Noah touched on this, is the grace in the people that he chooses. That many times, society tells us you have to be perfect in order to be of value. But God says, I want to use you as you are and refine you to be better, to be more like me. Are you guys with me? Can you turn down my mic a little bit? My voice is distracting to myself. Um, so thank you. <clears throat> so Moses, I don't like to say he was abandoned because his mom had faith and his mom knew that Moses was going to be taken care of, right? And God worked that out. And I have a quick picture to show. Um, sometimes when we want to picture this, this story, we put it in a Western world. We put it kind of like what it would look like in Michigan. This is a, a picture of part of the Nile River. It's a lot bigger than I thought. So there's a baby back there. Walter, can we look at your baby real quick? Just, there's a baby right there. Think of a baby um, in a basket. If you have a baby, think of your baby in a basket, if you have kids. Putting the baby in this river. There's hippos in this river. There's alligators in this river. Um, rivers have really strong currents, so rivers can be unpredictable as well. And you have Moses' mother who had faith in you. She wasn't abandoning him, but she was surrendering him to God, for God to protect and for God to have a plan. And I'm going to start out real quick. One point. First point. Everything that we've talked about so far. It may seem 
unknown. It may seem scary, but the first point is that God works out all things, and he cares for us even if we don't see it. If we get a chance to talk more about my story, I can tell you countless of times when God has shown this in my life. From not being sure how I was going to be able to afford university, right, as an immigrant, like, and it's like the only person of my family here, and then you have your parents in a different country making a different kind of currency that is not as valuable. Try to think about it, it's, it's pretty difficult. But what I came to learn through the, last four, through the last 27 years of my life, but especially in these last 14, has been that God works out all things, and he cares for us even if we don't see it. And you see this in the story of Moses with Pharaoh's daughter, literally in this palace, finding a baby, taking him. Moses' sister, Miriam, following along. And then, I just think she's a genius. She's like, hey, want me to find a, a woman to nurse your baby for you? Let me go get this woman. And it's actually Moses' mom, right? So you see God working all things to care for Moses, even as a baby who could not make his own decisions. And sometimes, let us slow down in time to notice those things, where God is working out things, maybe not in the way that we expect it, but definitely in a way that is all for his glory and part of a bigger story. I'm going to pick up here with some scripture. Um, <clears throat> during these 40 years that Noah talked about, that Moses was a shepherd, on one of these occasions, uh, Moses was in the desert and he saw this strange picture of a burning bush. So if I were to start a fire right now, I'm not going to. I don't have the abilities to do that. But if I burned this paper, it would automatically, you know, what's it called? Um, disintegrate, right? It would just turn to a pile of black stuff. But he sees this burning bush that continues to burn without burning up. Moses approaches, approaches this bush, and God tells him, anybody know the story? What does God tell Moses to do? Take your shoes off. Why? Because this is holy ground. Now, why would God do something like that? God wants to remind Moses that I am God, and you need to enter into my presence because I am a king here, right? And God is asking for that respect. I heard someone um, describe it too as, God asked Moses to take off his shoes because his shoes themselves were unholy. And sometimes God asks you to take unholy things off so that he can be in full contact with you in his presence. Right? So God tells Moses, take off your shoes. God also starts to tell Moses of his story, of his plan. Um, like Noah said, Moses' people have been oppressed. They've been enslaved and they've been crying out to God for God to save them, for God to rescue them. And this is when God comes to Moses. I don't know how God chose Moses. I don't know why God chose Moses. But this is where I want to pick up in the story. When Moses approaches, approaches God, Moses, with all this crisis identity, I can relate a lot to that, right? As someone who is now in a country that I, they were not born in, and I'm also getting into the stage of my life where I've lived as long as in the United States that I lived in Mexico. That's going to be hard to kind of like recognize that. But God tells Moses, I'm going to send you back to Egypt, back to this place that was difficult, that you had a lot of um, challenges in, right, that kind of cost a lot of this stuff in your life. I'm going to send you back. And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? Why are you sending me? Like Noah said, a man who has a crisis identity, right? Not too much of this, not too much of that, too, too little of this, too little of that. And now God is saying, I'm going to send you. And Moses says, who am I that you would send me? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites. All right, Moses is like, well, now what if I do go? And then this happens. So suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they, they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. The I am has sent you. And when God says this, he's kind of 
um, referencing to himself being an eternal God, being a God that has been there from the beginning of time to now, that the only way that he can describe himself is in a verb, that I, I just am. I am that I am. Story continues, and Moses again says, well, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? So now, what are you sensing of Moses at this time? There's some insecurity. What else are you sensing from Moses at this time? I think I heard it, but I don't know if I heard it. Fear, right? There's this fear as well. How many times has Moses tried to get God to tell him, give him more security, right? Why would I go? Who am I that you would send me, right? And God says, I'm going to give you three signs. The first one, back to Bible school, Sunday school. What's the first sign? And that is the staff. Who knows what happens with that staff that God's going to use that sign for? Turns it into a snake. I could grab this Sharpie right here, and then all of a sudden it could turn into a snake. Some of you guys would freak out. I would think it's the coolest thing ever because snakes are pretty cool. Uh, and then I would go, woo, and then somebody would freak out, right? Second one, the hand. What would happen to his hand? He would actually put his hand in his cloak, take it out, and then what happened to his hand? leprosy and leprosy was a very isolating disease right that people were so scared of the disease so now you see god taking something that people were so scared of moses puts it back and takes it out and his hand is healed so god is showing that power that i can take something that people are afraid of put it on take it away just like that nothing nothing has it on god's power like that and the last one water what was that sign what would happen to the water Turn to blood. Yeah, the water would turn into blood. And now water in Egypt, it was connected to a specific God, and it was connected specific to life. And God is saying, I got control over that too. So God is giving Moses three signs, three opportunities to kind of strengthen his faith and strengthen his confidence in God through these three miraculous signs. But Moses, once again, says... Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent. Eloquent, I, I don't know how to speak. I can't speak well. I cannot communicate well. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past, when I was living in the palace and I was receiving the education that all of these other people in the palace were receiving, that the Egyptians were receiving, um, nor since you have spoken to your servants. I am slow of speech and tongue. Moses here is revealing his insecurity. I can't do this, and this is why. And the Lord responds to him, who gave humans beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. Did God say, it's okay. It's okay, Daniel. It's okay, Moses. I got you. Did God say that? What did God say? Now go. God is saying, I have control. God is, saying, I, God is saying, I want to use you. Stop giving me excuses. Now, go. I will help you speak, and I will teach you what to say. But Moses said one more time, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. I don't want to go. This is too scary. I got, I'm too afraid. I'm, I'm too afraid I can't do it. I'm too insecure. Right? I haven't had the proper abilities, the proper qualifications to do this thing. God, send someone else. Don't send me. Have you ever been in a position where you say, hopefully somebody else will do it? Yeah? Hopefully, maybe somebody else can do it instead of me. I can't do it. Well, maybe if Joel's back there, I'm going to pick on Joel because he just showed up for my sermon. Go on, Joel. So I'm going to say, Joel, why would you pick me? Joel, Joel's been doing this a lot longer than I have. Joel can speak a lot better than I can. He knows probably the Bible better than I do. Send Joel. And this is where I go to my second point. I don't have them here. God has called you. And what reasons are you giving when not answering that call? What excuses are you giving and telling God, God, I sinned in this way. God, I don't have this qualification. God, I can't speak as good as somebody else. God, I don't have the knowledge that somebody else has. And the key here, too, is that God does not coddle our insecurities. 
He doesn't want to nurture those things. He wants to give us security and confidence, but he's not going to give it for us to find in ourselves. And God won't call you to something, sorry for the typo, something that he does not believe you can do. And I remember hearing this phrase when um, I was asked to be in my current job position. I tried to give every single reason and every single excuse of why I was not the right person to do this job. I thought, I am too young. I'm not even 30, like, why? I can't do this job. I'm too young. I don't have enough experience. I have not been in education long enough to do this, right? Also, too, I don't have the Bible knowledge to be teaching kids about God. Like, I have not gone to school for this. I spent four years learning about genetics and uh, biology and plants and, like, why the skull of one animal looks like the way that it does. And now you want me to teach kids what it is to follow Christ? I don't have the preparation for this. But the key here, when God is speaking to Moses, the key here is that God is not saying that the answer was in Moses. The answer is in him. The answer is in God. So when we are being sent out and we're giving all of these excuses and saying this is why I can't do it, that is actually a call for us to turn to God and recognize that it's not by our power and it's not by our might, but by the spirits of the living God. The key here is that Moses was only seeing in within himself and saying these are all the reasons why I cannot do it. But God says instead, I will be with you. He doesn't say, I know you can't speak well. I know you don't have the quality. He doesn't, God doesn't even say that. God doesn't even touch on that. He just says, I'm going to be with you. And that is going to be enough. And I've heard many people say, but I've been asking God to give me this, and I've been praying to God to give me this, and he's just not doing it. And my question to them are, is, are you actually following what God is asking you to do? Are you actually surrendering that trust and that faith in God to do what he has asked you to do? Because many times we think we're following what God has asked us to do, but the reality is we're following what we want to do or what people say, this is what you should be doing. The answer is not in you. The answer is not in me. The answer is in God as he is the source of that strength. The third point that I have is that God wants to create dependent, faithful followers of him. That's why he says, I am with you. And I was remembering how we spent this whole series about prayer and dependence on God. And so many times I find this within myself. Um, by the way, I hate public speaking. This is really hard for me. Did anybody see how nervous I was at the beginning? I was like, oh, no. it's like this, no? Um, I don't like public speaking. I forgot to say this, I'm the youngest of three. I have two older siblings who are highly um, achieving, very intelligent. They both got like 90% scholarship, like covered for the university because their abilities, they're both, they're amazing, right? They're great. They're not perfect because they're my siblings. Um, and I know them know them, right? So I know they're not perfect, but I had two highly achieving, highly liked, highly outgoing and extroverted siblings, and I'm very introverted, I'm very shy. I had to be forced by my parents. <clears throat> Claire, can I use you real quick? Okay, come here, come here. Pretend you're me, and my mom would be like, go say hi to them, go say hi, all you have to do, it's gonna be really, go say hi, right, thank you. Or I would have to like order my food, and I wouldn't even order my food like at restaurants. Like I would let my parents do it. I'm like, they know what I want. They know what I like. Let's just tell them. This is really uncomfortable. If something goes wrong in the restaurant, I really don't want to bring it up. I don't like to talk to people. I don't know. It's very uncomfortable for me. And then um, in school, I remember my junior year of high school. I'm very impressed with myself, and you'll know why in a second. My junior year of high school. Um, I had to do this final project. Sorry, Alan, should I move less? No, okay. My junior year of high school, I had to give this presentation as a final, and it was about a project, about something that you really cared about, and I actually did it on education in the situation in the border of Mexico and the US, so look at that, full circle. Um, I remember when I did that presentation, it was 10 minutes long. 
I cried the whole time through the whole presentation. I was so nervous. I was so anxious. I did not want to speak to three people. I did not want to speak to three people in a room. Right? So speaking to people, I know I'm, I'm up here. I don't like it. I actually don't feel like I could do it. But all that I know is that God is with me. And I know, because he's done it before, God can speak through you if you just surrender it to him. And God is going to give you that confidence to go before people that you've never been to before, to be able to share his love for them. Noah, how much time do I have? Zero time left? All right. I'm going to skip. Thank you. We didn't talk about that. I'm going to skip that. The last thing that I'm going to talk about um, is this point, my last point. God, which makes sense, was getting frustrated with Noah, this, with Moses, not Noah, not you. <laughs> he's, he's frustrated with me too. He's like, anyone you feel like God sometimes is just like, how many times have I told you? How many times have I shown you? And you still don't believe me. Anybody feel like sometimes God is saying that to you? Yeah, God just said that to me for the last six months. Um, the last point that I want to make here, the Lord's anger burned against Moses and he said, what about your brother? Because Moses said, um, please send someone else, right? What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He's already on his way to meet you. God already orchestrated this whole thing. And he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and I will teach you what to do. God again is saying, the answer is in me. I, I will do this. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. The last point here, something that has been very helpful for me, is that God has brought errands into my life. God sends us helpers along the way, and he doesn't send us alone, but brings a community that complements us. Where I was weak and where I needed to grow, God brought someone in my life who had that strength and who was able to also bring me up in that area, right? But also, I had a strength that that person did not have. So I was able to also support and encourage that person. So who is your Aaron? And if we're in church today, it's because we know and we believe. You guys are like, you're my Aaron, right? <laughs> yeah, I love that. But if we're in church today, it's because we know that we need an Aaron. We know that we cannot do this alone. Brian? You've got your Aaron, and I'm glad she's Lauren and not, you know. It's beautiful, beautiful Lauren. We all need an Aaron. Sometimes it's a spouse. Sometimes it's a really good friend. Sometimes it's a family member, but God does not send you alone. And when I came to the United States, I left my whole family in Mexico, and it was just me. And time and time again, God continues to bring Aaron's into my life to show me that I'm not alone. The last point and it's not even on the screen. When I was sitting there listening to uh, Noah, there is a phrase that came to mind. And we can think of ourselves by all our deficits, all the things that we've done wrong, all the things that we didn't quite achieve on. And there are all of these statistics, even for immigrants, even for people who have come into a new culture, maybe somebody who has been in prison before, right, that have been incarcerated, maybe you have um, a speech imped impediment or a learning disability. There are all of these statistics about people, about us. They try to put a number on us. And when I was sitting there, I was thinking, when we listen to the odds, we will never make it. But... When you leave it to God, you start to see mountains move. I had a friend tell me, a close family friend, when I told them that I wanted to go to college in the U.S., they looked at me and they said, I don't think that's something you can do. I don't think that's possible for you. I didn't say anything. I just was quiet. But in my heart, I knew that if I listened to those odds, she was right. I couldn't do it, but because I listened to God, because Moses listened to God and looked to him for faith, for strength, for provision, it was possible, and you could see those mountains move. When you listen to the odds, you will never make it through, but when you leave it up to God, you can start to see mountains move. Who believes that today?
Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your reminders, God, that you choose imperfect people. Lord, that to you we are lovely, we are valuable, that in you we can find our strength and our confidence, that through us, God, you choose to make your kingdom known. Lord, I, I pray that we would listen to your voice above all other voices, that we would depend on you, that we would have faith and trust in you. Lord, that as this church continues to grow and as we continue to reach others, that we would do it in confidence that we serve a mighty God. In your name we pray. Amen.